Former minister and founder of Something or Other Publishing, Wade Franson, is the host of Created in the Image of God, a series that examines the role of religion in society. From messianic returns to the emotive responses transmitted throughout our culture, Wade fearlessly addresses reality claims from all directions, objectively exploring their compatibility with Holy Scripture. Joining him are groundbreaking artist and podcaster Jacqueline Clare, whose focus on spiritual realism is summarized by the quote, when we don't take the high road with our choices and miss the opportunity to develop spiritual qualities, we literally forfeit the purpose of our lives. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to Created in the Image of God. Very happy to be here. Of course, this is a weekly show where we bring on a unique guest of varying perspectives to discuss different aspects of the role of religion in society. Tonight, we are introducing John Christie, who has created the Amazon Prime documentary, My Week in Atheism. If you're watching live, remember to drop a little chat, let us know you're out there and feel free throughout the show to ask questions and share your comments. We really love to hear from you. So let us know you're out there, give a little hello. So a little bit about John Christie. He is a student of religion, theology, biblical studies and classical studies, as well as a filmmaker. John is a teacher, speaker, presenter and advocate of Christianity. His attempts at engaging in civil dialogue with non-believers have been appreciated in debating the existence of God, historical Christianity, and the competency of the Christian faith. After spending many years in the creative and internet industries, um, producing he used those skills to produce this documentary that I mentioned, My Week in Atheism. And this is a film that we will discuss and share you share with you the trailer. We'll discuss throughout the show today. But in it, he has an up-close encounter with modern atheism in an attempt to learn while focusing on the reality of two opposing worldviews with his friend and atheist talk show host, David Smalley. John is currently in the process of completing a master's degree in Christian and classical studies. He holds a degree in religion and biblical studies and an associate's degree in practical theology. He is also a member of the Academic Society of Biblical Literature, American Academy of Religion, and Phi Theta Kappa National Honor Society member. All right, with that wonderful CV, let us bring our guest to the show, John Christie. Hello. Hey, John. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're very glad to have you. I think it's going to be really interesting tonight. And that was a very impressive list of credentials. And I want wanted to see if you could show a bit more the personal side behind those accomplishments, like your background and specifically like what guided you down the path that you're on now. Sure. Um, um, so I became a official born again Christian around the age of uh, 12 years old. Uh, before that, I grew up kind of part uh, Roman Catholic, part Greek Orthodox, come from an Italian Greek family. And um, religion was always kind of present, but never um, intimate. And uh, when I went through that born again experience, it became a very relational, intimate thing to me, more than just ritual and reverence, um, which led me after high school to go to a two year Bible college where I got my associates and uh, kind of left the academic world after that came back after that, uh, worked for a while in the church, was a little disheartened, maybe disillusioned from a lot of the um, goings on of the church being run as a business and, um, and just church structure in general. And so for several years, um, as you had mentioned, you know, I kind of found my path through, uh, started in graphic design, which led me to web development and then really flourished there through the dot-com age and into the early 2000s as a uh, web applications developer, uh, software solution engineer type of roles um, and really grew. 
after a while though um you know you you have this passion this hole that's not filled uh even though you're doing some wonderful things out you know in a career path and raising a family i decided to go back to school um which i went on to get my bachelor's degree at liberty university and um and i started by the way my associates at more of a charismatic uh non-denominational college and then my graduate studies went on to uh, Knox, which is a reformed school. So academically, I've kind of been all over the place within the Christian realm. Um, and while I was doing that, I was listening to podcasts and made friends with a podcast host, David Smalley, who I went on the show a couple times, and we would have conversations that would extend, you know, beyond the show and sometimes just a phone call. And I had made reference at one point saying, um, you know, I've done a lot of commercial video work, um, different things for web streams or web commercials, uh, some television production. And I said, you know, I would love to do a documentary of us and just our relationship because we get along so well. And I know I say this in the movie, um, but yet we have such opposing ideals. And he was like, that would be great. You could come and stay with me for a week. We'll film everything. You know, I can get us to go to like, one of the universities down here in Dallas, Texas. At the time I was in California and we said, yeah, we could call it like, you know, my week in atheism or something like that. And long story short, week turned into a year because we ended up doing several different conventions, meeting several different people. And it was a truly great experience. One that Dave and I are still friends. Um, we still communicate. I haven't been on his show for a few years now, but we still, you know, keep in touch and, and not just him, but some of the other guys from the movie. And, uh, and it really just kind of catapulted me into the atheist community. And I've been active in and out of it for the last, um, well, the movie now is filming. I was amazed to think of it was 10 years ago, 2013. And the movie was released in 2014. So, um, you know, it's still getting some traction. There's still viewers. I still get that Amazon royalty check every month from, people watching it so thank you very much <laughs> um and the amazing thing is is a lot of what's in there i now now see it you know 10 years laying out in society um which is really interesting to me uh just to see how it was was foretelling in a sense of a lot of society days um so yeah <laughs> Yeah, so much that you said is very, very interesting to me. Um, before I connect all those dots, can you speak a little bit more about that tantalizing tidbit you just gave us about how you feel like the documentary was somewhat uh, foretelling or seeing something going on in the world before it was as sharp as it is now? Sure. So one of the moments in the movie, um, and I say this it was the end of the year, one of the conventions, I forget which one. And um, and we just did a like segment in our hotel room at night. And we had talked about a few different things. And um, I asked, I say to Dave, as I've learned, is that while a the atheist movement is about religion and religious belief, um, I see it more as a political movement. And David echoes it and says, absolutely it is. You know, we're all about equality and where, you know, and he gives his political statement to what they're trying to do as a movement. And what I've seen is over the last 10 years, and I've said this often to a lot of friends, um, and I'm not making a political claim on either side as much as just to state the facts as, what, as I've seen them. A lot of the phrases I hear coming out of the liberal left side right now in society are phrases that were spoken to me back then from the atheist community and I've heard for years. They are things like following the science, we use the logic and reason, it's the positioning mm -hmm. of we are the group that thinks with our brain, you are the group that's full of nonsense and, um, and emotion. And, uh, and it's a lot of things that are about um, basically autonomy, not wanting to be controlled. Um, again, those are some of the key things that I've heard as statements that were made repeatedly. You know, we use logic and reason, we have science on our side. 
Um, and I'm hearing those mirrored now in the political spectrum. And it was, at first it was really surprising to me, but I've kind of become used to it at this point. But, um, but I do see similarities and parallels between the atheist community and what now, you know, I would label, I guess, as liberal America, the left leaning America. Um, it seems to me like we have separated in that, you know, not only now is it the Christian right, I would call it the atheist left. So. Wow, so interesting. Would you say that atheism is anti-God or is that too strong a way to put it? I would say that. I don't think they would say that. I think your typical response from an, from atheists is that, you know, they don't make a claim one way or the other toward God, which, to be honest, I find um, ironic uh, or maybe flat out foolish at times because they make very definite claims, but yet they're always portraying their position as we make no absolute claims. We don't know if there's a God. We take the default position, which they claim the default position to be atheism or non-belief. Um, but I think anthropology and science itself has argued against that as well, uh, which we won't go into. But there's plenty of reason to believe that our default position is more a theistic position than it is an atheistic position. Hello, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, there I'm we go. Sorry. I was trying to understand it was what's going so on. I didn't know good. Me. You should have heard it. That was the best part of this whole show. If only you guys had heard it. I'm sorry about that. Um, I was just saying thank you for everyone who in the chat who's let us know you're out there. We we fixed the sound. Thank you. Um, we are about to take a quick break and share your wonderful trailer with the audience. Um, but before we do show the trailer of my week in atheism, I wanted to ask you just a fun question personal, your perspective, John, if everyone in the world would just do this one thing, it would make the world a better place. What's your answer? Believe in Jesus Christ as Lord. Amen. Very simple. <laughs> All right. Let's show that trailer for my week in atheism. Okay. You won't do that. I won't do that. But because, you can do it with the Bible. Because all the time. my salvation doesn't depend on a country song, All the John. more reason why you should not do that with the Bible. God is not supposed to be the author, author of confusion. We are in disagreement. We have two completely opposing worldviews, and that comes out. John and I are, are good friends, despite the fact that we understand we are clearly enemies in the social movement. Guys like us shouldn't get along as well as we do, but we do. Do you think I deserve to go to hell? You're passing a judgment. You don't want God to pass a judgment. Basically, John Christie heard my show, and he's been listening to a lot of atheist podcasts and stuff. He wants to do this documentary called My Week in Atheism, and he's staying with me for a few days. He's coming with me to Austin for the American Atheist Convention. He's one of these guys that we're pretty convinced is going to be an atheist in 12 months. There are a generation of non-believers that are not coming from belief. There are a gener there's a generation of non-believers coming around that never had it. And I think that they're going to have an attitude a lot like The simplest thing is, philosophically speaking, it is the lack of belief in a God or the rejection of theistic claims. It's not the assertion that there is no God. I think people have a moral obligation to be reasonable. And I think once they're reasonable, they'll become atheists like me all by themselves. If you have that simple definition for an objective moral standard, then everything the Bible teaches is immoral. I'm trying to understand your side. You know, I'm not just holding my Bible tightly and saying I must believe. I'm welcoming your objections. Because it's really 
upon all of us to know why we believe what we believe and to be able to defend our faith. Wow, I just love that trailer, John. You <laughs> Thank did, you. You did uh, such an excellent job with that. Uh, and um, I really hope that some of our audience will be encouraged to go check out the entire movie. Um, I've taken actually a few quotes from that trailer that I'd like to now dig in a okay. little bit deeper for the rest of the show tonight. Um, but I wanted to start off by saying or by asking a follow on question to uh, the part that Jacqueline was was interviewing you on, you mentioned um, a, a declaration, a conversion, uh, being born again at age 12. So I was reminded of my own experience as a child in Sweden at around that same age, I think I was 11, and responding to an altar call in, in atheistic, godless Sweden of all places, right back in the, <laughs> back in the day. Um, and I, and I know why what was going on in my life that made me susceptible and open mm. to that call at that time. So I'm, I'm just a little curious, what was, what was going on with you at age 12 that opened you up to go down that path and make that commitment at that time? Yeah, that's such a great question. And, um, and no one's ever asked me that before. And I'm, I'm happy you did because I had such an awareness at that young age of, um, I'm going to just label it as my need for salvation or yeah, I guess I'll just say my need for salvation. Um, I was at, a, it was at a time in my life. Um, my father had gone to prison, um, two years prior and, um, you know, single family home, very loving mother, but, um, she wasn't always the most outwardly showing of it. Um, I got into a lot of trouble neighborhood kids, different things. And I just, I could just tell I was a young kid in a very destructive path. And we were at the time living um, in Virginia and we moved back to Massachusetts to be with family because now, you know, our father's in prison and um, we need family around us to help raise um, the youngest of five kids. And uh, I was very angry, I was very bitter I was very um, just, I wasn't a good little kid and I knew it in my heart. Like I had just so many feelings and anger and um, I didn't trust anything or anyone. And I, it's hard to explain because I was so young and I didn't experience enough of the world to be able to lash out in ways that maybe I would have at an older age, drugs, alcohol, who knows. But, um, but I was going through such a, self-awareness i'll say of my own depravity in life and um and i didn't like it at a young age i didn't like the person i saw myself becoming as weird as that may sound for a 12 year old kid i could see it and we had some friends come over to the house we had moved to uh, massachusetts and uh, i believe they were co-workers of my mother's i know what it was now at the time it just seemed like we were having friends over for dinner but this was some born again Christians on an evangelical mission. And uh, this man, Jack, shared the gospel. And I'd never heard it like that. I'd never heard about Jesus this way. Again, you know, I'd gone to mass. I'd been to the Greek Orthodox Church on Easter Sundays, the Greek Easter. Um, but everything was rituals and, and it was boring and very life giving. And it was something that I recognized immediately as this is what I was looking for. I know I can't fix myself. I know I can't fix my father. I know I can't fix my world. I need something. And um, I don't even remember the presentation really, but I remember just knowing I wanted this. I wanted what he was talking about. And he led us in prayer. And as we were praying, I remember sitting there like with my legs crossed on the floor and I could feel like, I say it, even though my legs were crossed, I could feel it like from my toes coming up through my legs, through my torso, my head. I mean, as I'm describing it now, I'm getting chills, you know, because this was 
wow, I'm ashamed to say this was about 40 years ago, <laughs> almost 40 years, 39 years ago. And I can remember it like it just happened an hour ago. And it was, I, the, and this may sound weird, but the feeling I got from it was like when you peel a fruit roll up off that waxy paper <laughs> and I could feel it, but it was like pulling outside of me. Like the whole outside layer was just being lifted off from my feet to my head and it was gone. And you know, I look at that as that was my sinful nature. That was the old man. That was the old me. And I was given another chance through Christ. And uh, wow, it, it's emotional to feel that way because at a young age, you know, I knew the path my life was going down. And again, it wasn't that I necessarily saw myself going to prison. It wasn't necessarily that I saw myself committing the worst of crimes, but I was faced with my sinful nature, with my depravity and Christ gave me a new life. You know, I was truly, truly felt like I was born again. And, and I remember my mom saying to me that night, you know, something's different about you. You look different. I remember friends saying, you're different. Like what's going on? You're very different, you know? And I think it was the anger, the bitterness, um, the hurt, um, you know, didn't like make life easier. My father was still in prison. I still had that to wrestle with over years and, you know, different things, you know, everything was still there, but I was a new man. Thank you for asking that. We never really no, and th and ask that. Well, and thank you for sharing. And, uh, you know, not to minimize any other aspect of it, but when you mentioned your father in prison, I knew right away and I, and I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't want to downplay that aspect of it because if you think about David, right? The King David and, um, or excuse me, Saul, actually, you know, King Saul, there's yeah. a statement about, God, you know, when it came time for God to sort of reject Saul and then select David as his replacement king, there's a statement about Saul, when you were small in your own sight, when you were little in your own sight, I could work with you. And there's this moment where you have an opportunity to realize that sinful nature, just who and what you are. And, you know, many times we, we, have situations where, as Paul described, our conscience becomes seared and we can no longer sort of see things with that clarity. And it's beautiful when, as in your case, somebody accepted that at that age and has held on to it and yeah. has not lost that. Right. And I'm going to just share a little bit of, of, of my experience. So for me, I had my parents were divorced and I'd actually been kidnapped in a domestic kidnapping. And I was separated from both parents when I was over in Sweden and my two sisters. And that was that moment of being completely lost and thrown into this foreign environment. Right. They didn't speak English for some reason. Nobody in Sweden spoke English, you know, uh, and uh, they weren't going to change for me. I was the one that had to change and it was difficult. Um, but then there was this moment later when I was 19, where despite, despite that as a child, I actually did, succumb to many of the you know influences and whatnot and the baggage that came from all that and i and i was later returned to the u.s and i did actually get involved in the alcohol and the drugs and whatnot but then there was this moment at age 19 where i, I was in a high-speed chase with the alaskan state troopers in hot pursuit oh. and i ran off the road at 120 miles an hour Oh, my gosh. Oh, actually, it was probably only about 100 miles an hour. I, don't, I like to be totally honest about this. I had been going 120 or 130, but by the time I actually flew off the road, I was probably only 120 because I had taken an exit, slammed on my brakes, um, and had a miraculous life-saving experience. And, and, and that transformative moment was what it took for me to really get serious about following God and accepting what Jesus had really done. And it was in the moment where I realized God saved me, not when I, not because I was doing anything good. Right. And so between the age of 11 and 19, I had been in a, some might call it a legalistic environment where the focus was really on obedience to God, submission to God, and he will reward you for your good behavior. Essentially. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that aspect of what the Bible teaches. But it was the fact that Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners mm -hmm. that sunk in at that moment. My life was spared not because I was doing anything good. But God, in my view, knew that I needed 
that chance to know that, no, I really do love you, regardless of whether you're behaving well or right. behaving poorly. The love of God sh shone through in that moment. And that was the transformative moment for me at age 19 after having had that experience at age 11 as well. So yeah, I just no, thought I would good. share that little vignette um, from my life. And, you know, I, I really felt an affinity with you as you were explaining the circumstances of that submission to God at age 12 and the acceptance of that sacrifice for yeah. the remission of sins and the, you know, the old man dying and all that. It was really actually powerful. You sharing that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It was very powerful in my life. <laughs> like I said, all these years later, and it feels like it just happened last night. Well, and so now again, we, we, we saw a slightly different John, your, your, your hair is a little bit lighter and maybe a little bit less <laughs> since you did the video. Um, and uh, clearly you're not an atheist. You know, those, some of those folks on that said, we'll, we'll, we'll have this guy within nine months, he'll be an atheist. So, so yeah. what happened? You know, you're not an atheist, but maybe it, it did age you that experience or what, what's been <laughs> going on with you since, you know, as a result of that or since then. Yeah. I mean, in all fairness, I never for one minute thought I would be an atheist. I, I, I mean, to the, to the point in my life when I finally did the movie again, between that personal experience and other things over the course of my life. Um, you know, one of the things that I always talk about when I talk about the evidences of God's existence, the five evidences and the fifth one being personal experience, I always say is probably the least important in fact into in relating to other people, because I can't prove my personal existence to anyone or my personal experiences to anyone, but yet it's the most powerful to have in keeping our faith. And so my life is filled with Several, I shouldn't say filled, but there are several moments in life that I know that there's a God. Now, I intellectually can rationalize it. I think it's the most logical position we can have of the world around us, the existence that we have, the universe. I think it makes complete sense according to science and logic. But I know it because of those personal experiences, you know, and that's really what has secured me. So I never went into it thinking in a sense for a moment that atheists had a chance in converting me. And in fact, I was so secure that I personal relationship, I would say, with Christ. Um, but he, you know, had gone to church on Sundays and was part of youth group, but he was just a teenage kid who went to church and was kind of in the youth group. And um, some of the atheists would say, David Small even said, you know, does it bother you bringing Chandler with you? Because, you know, we can convert him. They were so certain that they could. <laughs> and I said, you know, look, um, truth is truth. And Chandler wants to know the truth. And he's got me telling him one truth and you guys telling him your truth. And uh, I'm all for it. I'm all for him being challenged because he can't rely on my faith. He has to build his own faith, he has to grow right. in his own. And Chandler now is um, 28 years old, and uh, he's about to be 20 old, and he's studying for his master's program as a uh, chaplain, MDiv in chaplaincy, and he's a military chaplain. He's actually a uh, first lieutenant, and um, and he's uh, in the Army and serving right now part-time in the National Guard until he finishes his, uh, his master's degree at Liberty University, and he'll be a full-time military chaplain. So I think it's worked out good Congratulations. for him. And, and Congratulations. he's a great, great yeah. um, apologist in his own right, you know? Yeah. Well, one, one thing you said sparked another thought, and that is the, um, the personal experience aspect, because I mentioned that high-speed pursuit, there's, there's, there's some miraculous circumstances around why I didn't die. And I mean, truly miraculous. But but there's this there's this it's kind of like the the purpose of prophecy right mm -hmm. um, or other other proofs other proofs of God and you know science and atheists you know they're, they're like the, the the people that were testing Jesus and demanding a sign right and God's just not going to give that sign to anyone who's already predisposed to deny it right and when something 
miraculous happens, it's for a specific purpose. And so it was pointless for me to try to even convince anybody else that there was a miraculous circumstance. I recognized even then, this is for me. It's not for anybody else. And you talked about that right. personal direct experience. This is for me. It's not for anybody else. It's for my faith. It's a gift of God for me. Mm -hmm. They have to have their own experiences. They have to open themselves up to God. They can't relate to God through my experience. Right. And I think I when can... we try to put that on people, that's where we resort to dogma. We resort to legalism. Um, I think that's where we resort to denominations is we're and, trying to put our personal convictions, our personal experiences on other believers. One of the most fascinating aspects of this discussion to me is the difference between objectivity and subjectivity, what it really is. And, and you know, s science and those that you were perhaps discussing, having discussions with, want something that's objectively, certifiably true and proven. And yeah. It feels like to me, God's just not going to give them that. You know, God is going to allow them to continue to deny him as long as they want. Yeah. And I was just talking about this the other day with um, my brother in law. We were having coffee and in the discussion, we were talking. And I'm not sure, I don't believe C.S. Lewis originated this. I don't know where it came from, but I believe he's the one that I think was saying it is, you know, for those that want to believe, there's enough evidence. And for those that don't want to believe, there is not, there never will be enough evidence. And normally, you know, the way people look at that is, um, yeah, because you have biases and you're blinded one side or the other. And there is that sense to it. But there's also the sense of it's man's coming to God is a humbling experience. And I don't see it necessarily as a want to believe as much as I see it as a willingness to submit. Again, that autonomy, that thy will done, not my will be done. If we're not willing to bend our knee, then there's no way we're going to see any evidence of God because we are not willing to submit to it. And well, let, me, it, let me just have one yeah. last thing. Sorry, I'll just yep. be real quick. Um, there's a great song um, Joan Osborne did, What If God Was One Of Us? And the line I love in it that's been so impactful is, if God had a face, would you want to see it? if in seeing it, you knew that you would have to believe. And I think that sums it up is, Interesting. You know, do you really want to know the evidence for God? Because it means you're going to submit your knee and you're not ready to do that. So you'll never see it. Beautiful. I'll, I'll, I'll add one thought to that. We can pick up on this here in a, when we come back. We're going to go to a commercial break. Um, the faith chapter, right? Hebrews 11. Yes. He that would come to God must believe that he is. Yeah. And and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Right. So th that's kind of like the, the statement of, of how you're going to get to God. And if yeah. you're not willing to go down that route, if you're going to insist on this quasi objectivity and sort of force God to prove himself to you, you know, he's just not going to play that game with you. Right. Um, but on that note, this next commercial break, um, we'll be looking at uh, journalism behind bars and the search for truth and the search, search for facts. And there's an opportunity here for those of you in the audience who would like to participate in this creative effort uh, of this anthology. So we'll go now to that commercial break and we'll pick this up in a minute. Your story has the power to start a movement. Journalism is more than a tool for broadcasting news. It's an important way of fostering meaningful cultural relationships that create tangible change in our society. With our anthology journalism behind bars, you can now do your part and make your mark. From expert writers to passionate amateur, everyone has a story to tell. Our aim is to promote equality, empathy, and create a safe space for different perspectives and interpretations of the world around us. Come join us today and break free from the toxic news cycle by submitting your story to journalism behind bars at superllc.com. So Something or Other Publishing, Soup LLC, is one of the sponsors of this show. And uh, they have an anthology series, which we're collaborating with them, as well as with PlankSip, which is a media journalism company up in Canada, to launch a series of anthologies which will bring these diverse perspectives together and allow 
whether it's an atheist, whether it's a theist, whether it's a uh, somebody on the, the right, somebody on the left, whether it's somebody who's pro this or anti that, to present their perspective and to put forth their argument in a context uh, that allows us to examine these issues a little bit outside the echo chambers that have been created and see if we can't find some common ground or reach some solutions. So we're very excited about this anthology program. That's just one of many that we'll be announcing. We want to encourage everyone to uh, reach out to info at soupllc.com to, uh, you know, to submit their expression of interest. So John, back to you right before that break, we were talking about, uh, you know, this idea of, of how, how do you, how do you come to God? And, um, what is it? What is it? So on the flip side, you know, some of the atheists were expecting you to to become, you know, a member of their camp. Were you expecting any of them to change their opinion? And was there any resonance coming, you know, back at you from those efforts? What have you seen in that front? Um, I honestly can't say I was expecting anybody. I was hoping. I wasn't expecting. I did. Um, by way of, um, and we talk about this in the movie, I believe we talk about this. Um, one of the listeners to Dogma Debate, when I was on that with David Smalley several times, who was an atheist, has reached out to me and had said one morning, I got a text or an email and it said, you know, would God, can God still forgive an atheist? And then I was like, of course he can. Why do you ask? And she was going through an experience and we talked for a while and she became a Christian. And as far as I know to this day, um, I do know because we're Facebook friends, she's still a Christian and she converted from atheism. And it wasn't because of um, my movie or being on dogma debate, but she did feel inclined to reach out to me and, you know, she'd listened on the show and, and we talked and um, the response to that was a lot of anger from, um, from David, you know, and, and he had said, you know, he felt like he'd lost one type of thing. Um, and as well from some of other atheists that thought, you know, well, she was never an atheist in the first place. And the, the, the no, no true Scotsman <laughs> argument. Right? Um, and so she wasn't a true believer. The conversion <laughs> hadn't really taken root. No, no. To them, it was she was right. right. She was never a true atheist right. believer. Right? Exactly. Yes, no, I'm I just saying. I'm flipping right. the I'm flipping the yeah. dialogue there. So, um, you know, been things through life over the last 10 years that, um, you know, I've been close to David on and some of some others, David Fitzgerald, who's another one in the movie. And, you know, I haven't seen that conversion, but I still am hoping, um, you know, I still pray for those guys. Um, we're still friends. So, you know, and, and again, even though sometimes there's a gap uh, when we do talk, it's kind of like we pick up where we left off. So, uh, yeah, never really expected it, but I've, I've really, I'm still hoping for it. And I do get emails from, usually the emails I get come from atheists that tell me how much of an idiot I am and how wrong I am and things to that extent. But I like listening to you. You seem like a nice guy. And so then they'll, they'll listen to my podcast and they'll, they keep going. So I figure, you know, as long as I got them listening to me, they're not turning me off. We got a chance. So well, um, and on on that note, another thread out of the of the trailer was, um, we are clearly enemies in the social movement, right? <laughs> well, yeah. okay. So, but you said you get along. So what what is the what is this social movement? I think you talked a little bit about it with Jacqueline earlier, um, when you talked about what what they were saying then and what you're now seeing, right? Yeah. Um, Ten years later. Uh, but but what is that? What is that? What's what social movement? You know, dip dip into that, unpack that a little bit more yeah. for us. So so yeah, that was a that was a statement David Smalley made. Um, so I've never really seen us as the enemies. Um, but you know that that was his expression, and we left it in the movie. And I even said to him when we were filming, like, really, enemies? And he's like, well, you know what I mean. Like we're you know on opposite <laughs> sides, and he kind of smoothed yeah. it. But I'm like, well, you know, you said it, so we'll leave it and. Um, but it made the point, you know, we're on opposite sides and we're in a, what I see as a spiritual battle against each other. Um, the social movement, again, at the time, I didn't know what he really meant, to be honest with you. And, and the filming of that part was um, at the end. We went back after we had done all the conferences and stuff. We did kind of the in-studio 
filming where we kind of have this back and forth throughout the movie where I talk, he talks. I'm in Cali Sacramento, California. He's in Dallas, Texas in his studio. And this kind of, it, it kind of weaves throughout the movie as like our carry on things. Um, and I really wasn't fully sure what it meant at the time. Now, again, I see it and he states it in the movie. And um, David, there's a lot of Davids in atheism, I guess. Uh, another David, uh, and I can't remember his last name, but he- M Men he after God's own heart. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He was at the time uh, the president of the um, American Atheist Convention, and I can't, but anyway, he says in the movie about how atheists basically, you know, are, they want religion gone. Now, right. while they'll say, we don't want to impose that on society, and we don't want to lock you up, but basically we want to influence laws and, and rules in this country so that you don't get your Christian way. David Silverman, someone just posted. Thank you very much. That's it. David. And I think that's the gist of what David Smalley, David Silverman, and, and many of the atheists at that time with their conventions and their movement were really doing was they were creating this social movement to say, in a sense, get your hands off of my salvation, get your hands off of my faith, get your hands off of, off of me, you know, my will done, let me do what I want to do. And they were doing it in what they would call the name of equality, which was questionable. Right. right. Um, but that's where I said, you know, and then I started seeing over the last decade, many of these coined atheist phrases popping up in mainstream media and being used by people on, on the left, really predominantly of things yeah. like, you know, we follow the science. Right. We are the ones with logic <clears throat> and reason. And well, and spe speaking of that successful. Yeah, speaking of that, that triggered uh, a memory in my mind where a few years ago it suddenly occurred to me, wait a minute, I thought apocalypse was the domain of religion, you know, to pronounce <laughs> from the book of Revelation that the sun is going to get 10 times hotter and that there will be plagues on mankind and starvation. I'm like, something strange is happening here because <laughs> science... You know, go, going back a few decades, science was pronouncing a world of leisure and technology is going to solve every problem. And right. someone someone flipped a switch and suddenly science is now predicting all the horrors of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Absolutely. And they've, they've become advocates of those same scenarios that used to be the domain of religion. And I think this is significant something happened wherein rather than seeking to inspire there is fear mongering from the domain of science and just today to to throw in a you know a a tangent angle just today Pfizer was um actually um confessed to fraud and a $2.3 billion judgment was issued against them for things oh, wow. that they were for things that they were doing pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, before COVID happened, happened, the, the way in which they were pushing drugs through doctors has now been um, you know, targeted by the Justice Department, and a $2.3 billion settlement has been reached, which of course exonerates them of criminal activity and keeps them from going to jail. Um now, how, how does that relate to what I'm saying? Well, follow the science, the science, the science. The term the science has been used in place of God. It's a you religion. Know, whatever somebody now claims the divine science to have said from the top of Mount Sinai, you know, is now the new word of God, the new dogma that everyone must submit to. But of course, we know that science is very, very different from God. Science is a process that says it is anything but all-knowing, right? Yeah, the very definition exactly. of science is it's agnostic and it, it is unbiased, right? Which, of course, is a lie. Um, I just find all of this fascinating. What's your reaction to, to those yeah. issues that were just raised? When I heard Dr. Fauci claim that he represents the science, that knocked me on the ground um i mean that can do you get me closer to thus saith the lord from a <laughs> non-religious position like seriously you know that's moses coming down from like you said mount sinai and saying thus claim god i represent the science listen to me he's 
putting himself. That's why, you know, when people will joke and well, call certainly, him Pope certainly Pope, a high priest or an infallible Pope. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, and it's 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 not long before the oppressor be, or the oppressed becomes the oppressor. It's not long before man's depravity shows itself and we choose to believe that we can too be like God or we should be in the high position as you, you know, as the whether it's Isaiah or it's Genesis three, that's what we see is that man wants right. to ascend to that position. And right. it's only a matter of time before we show that ugliness. And again, my experience at 12, while I was becoming aware, I will say of my depravity, that's the story of mankind. That's not just isolated to myself. And we will show our depravity by our trust in ourselves over God. And that's the ultimate, um, that's well, the garden of Eden right there. Well, and so it's very interesting, and this this is probably a topic for a future show. But let me tee it up here. I've you know I've spent a lot of my time and thought in the genesis in the in the story of the stories of Genesis, and my conclusion is based on what Paul says. You know when he when he talks about Christians and says that you have need of being taught again the fundamentals of your faith. Um, you know, you have need of milk, right? The milk of the word strong meat belongs mm. to those who by reason of use have exercised their senses to discern good and evil. That for me was the key that unlocked an understanding of Genesis in which, look, God always knew that Adam and Eve would take the fruit of the tree that he had forbidden them to take. And in fact, he even put the serpent there to whisper in their ear and get them to do it. The path forward for humankind always had to be through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was always going to happen. In that sense, it was God's intent. Why? Because God wants us to grow up and learn on our own. He wants us to listen to him, but he wants to also allow us to put our fingers on that hot stove and get burnt and learn from that experience. And, you know, at some point take his guidance, but then go and, you know, learn for ourselves as well. And but reason of use, exercise our senses to discern good and evil. Otherwise, he would have created robots. Exactly right. right. And, and right. why, you know, why play that game? Because what they were exposed to was the knowledge of good and evil. They right. couldn't know the depth of their depravity until they experienced it. And that's what they got to know. It really didn't matter what the tree was. It didn't matter what the fruit was. What mattered was they chose themselves over God and they saw the depth of their depravity. Again, what I saw, began to see at 12 years old. And you have to get to that point in right. order to realize I'm dependent. I need what you got to at 12 years old is, hey, right now I need help. Right now, I, I see myself making mistakes that I don't want to make. I see myself getting into water that's over my head. I see myself making decisions that will have long-lasting negative consequences on me and others. And I would rather have God, I would rather have the humility, right, to accept God's guidance Yeah. yeah. Than, than figure this piece out on my own, you know. God wants us to be able to come to him like a father and say, you know what? I've got this situation. I'd really like some advice here. And God's never going to tell us what to do. He's never going to tell us exactly what to do. Um, but he's going to give us guidance that helps us work through it and figure it out. Yeah. Amen. Speaking of which, that leads us to our next commercial break. A um, little thing called Ocean 2.0. Um, I think it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting Tool from one of our sponsors. Let's go to that break and we'll be back to wrap this up. Discover the world's religious traditions like never before with Ocean 2.0 Reader. Our custom ebook reader is designed for exploration and study with an immersive audio integrated reading experience and powerful research tools. Available on all platforms, including web, Windows, Mac OS. Linux, Android, and iOS. Experience the benefits of immersive reading by combining ear and eye and improve comprehension and vocabulary acquisition. And with our interfaith library featuring books from Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, Judaism, Jainism, Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, Christianity, Islam, and Baha'i. You'll have access to a wealth of knowledge. Try Ocean 2.0 Reader today and elevate your reading experience. 
Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So, I John, love we Max spent McClain's a lot of voice. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, we spent a lot of time really developing common ground. Now, I'm going to put. I'm not exactly going to put you on the defensive, but I'm going to push back a tiny bit now on a couple of points in fairness to the to the atheists and that other side right which i don't belong to but still no, I, I i love i love the the challenge and being you know be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you um for the hope that lies within you right so um on that show the trailer one of the people that you were working with said if you have that simple definition for an objective moral standard then everything the bible teaches is immoral w where was he coming from and i know that this could be take an hour to unpack but if you can try to make it succinct where was he coming from by what standard was he judging god to be immoral sure um i'll sum it as saying the the do no harm right if we look and i and i actually I have a guest that's going to be coming on my podcast back into it this spring that is an atheist, former professor who believes in objective morality, and that many atheists that I've met believe in objective morality. They don't believe it comes from the source of God, but ultimately can be found in that statement of do no harm. And if we have that as an objective standard, and you look at the Bible, and Aaron Ra <laughs> is the gentleman who said that, in his position, the Bible violates that completely. Right. And I, you know, would argue. Well, what, what's wrong religions. with genocide? What's wrong with going in and wiping out men, women, children, and animals? Right. I, well, I, that's yeah, the I position. That. That's yeah, <laughs> right. that's the position. And and again, yes, there's a lot. You know, it's a it's a complex answer that can't be answered in the sound bites succinctly and accurately. Um, right. But there, but there are true answers to that. And I think where where that comes from is you know, the way I look at that often when people try to wrap those things into a real simple like here's my explanation of why I resist it. Um, you know, for thousands of years, people have been wrestling over these things and coming up with really good, profound understandings of God by wrestling with these questions. So they're not as easily dismissed as do no harm. The Bible does some harm. Therefore God is horrible or doesn't exist. <laughs> right. That's just, that's amateur. <laughs> yeah. I mean, nobody has a right to live by that standard. Yeah. Um, okay. So, that is that is something I don't mean to be facetious. I don't mean to be flip about it, though. I, I love being flip sometimes. Um, that's something perhaps for a, for a whole show that we can dig into oh, in the future if we have you back. Um, but one that's more because it is amateur, but but it takes time to unpack it. But one that's of greater interest to me, one that I, I had to wrestle with was um, Christianity specifically, not God, but Christianity. And the standard which Jesus raised in John 13, verse 35, where he said, by this shall all men know you that you have loved one for another. And the challenge that I had in the groups that I was in um, was when, 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 the, when the global denomination that I was a part of, and I was a minister for a while, um, for about a decade or more. Uh, but when we began to have doctrinal differences and the church split down the middle, and we had a kinder, gentler version of hell. We didn't actually believe in, in a hell that is typical of Christianity. Hell might be described as separation from God. That wasn't exactly our description of it, but separation from God is hell, right? So, but still, we believed that these other people were now separated from God because of some twiggy doctrinal difference. But the, the way in which we treated them Right, yeah. who were not part of our specific closed, hermetically sealed belief system, um, led me to question: Well, well, how can you claim to be a true Christian when the sign is "By this shall all men know you that you have loved one for another"? So the fundamental question I'm, you know, going to pose to you is that, you know, well, well, how can Christianity be representative of Christ's teachings when, you know, throughout the ages? Christian denominations have condemned even their brothers to hell over doctrinal differences. And yeah. that certainly doesn't seem to meet that standard. And I think what we first have to do is under, or differentiate between Christianity and Christians or the label of Christians. Um, even, you know, we had talked about um, on my website, one of the 
titles I use or, or claims that I make is I'm an advocate of Christianity. That right. doesn't mean I'm an advocate of the American evangelical fundamental Christian beliefs. That doesn't mean I'm, a, I'm an advocate of any denomination. That means I'm an advocate of Jesus Christ and the teachings that he gave. Or I would say I'm an advocate of the Bible, uh, the 66 books of the Protestant Bible and that theology. So in that, you know, I would say that my objective moral standard comes from um, Jesus's teachings. You know, when he was questioned uh, the greatest commandments of, or the greatest of the law, it was to love the Lord, your God, with everything inside of you, all of your being, your actions, your mind, your thought, whether you're asleep or awake, it's you. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if we can do those things, I think um, that would solve every problem we have in the world. And someday it will come in the form of New Jerusalem. But um, but now, you know, that's what we're wrestling with. And so Christians do a lot of damage. I was involved in the filming of another um, documentary that never actually made it into post-production and was completed called 40 Churches in 40 Weeks, where we went across the country and um, had interviews with different churches. But one that stuck out to me there was in Texas. And it was a church of about 400 that had been whittled down to about 25 people, doctrinal differences. And it was over predestination. And I had said um, to them in the interview, I had said, you know, I'm, I believe in free will. I don't know if I'd call myself an Arminianist exactly, but I believe in free will. Would I be welcome to this church? And he said, well, as long as you weren't being divisive. And I said, okay, <laughs> fair. Um, what's divisive? And they couldn't answer me. Right. They couldn't define what was divisive. And I we'll thought, decide, well, we'll just, we'll we'll decide that what that is when we decide to be divisive exactly. and throw you out. <laughs> you know? And I just thought, you know. And we'll blame it on you. We'll blame it on you. Families were tore we apart. And it's like, this is the damage that we do, even when we are under the name of Christianity, when we are filled with ourself and our love for ourself more than we are for our neighbor and for God. And this is what it creates, you know, um, it's horrific. And again, it goes back to that depravity. The depth of our depravity is, is scary. And sometimes it's so scary how it deceives us even into believing we are good. And, um, and that's probably the worst case of it. We, you know, we are dependent on, um, God, on specifically pointedly Jesus Christ and without him over our life as Lord and Savior by giving him our will, the depth we can go to to hurt one another and ourselves, whether we carry the Christian label or not, is um, it's it's that's hell. That's hell. We don't need hellfire and brimstone. That is hell. So I've, I've often commented in the past that um, the most difficult truth for God to reveal to us when we talk about doctrinal differences, right? Because I belonged to a denomination that took the Bible very seriously, that took submission to God very seriously. Um, another great comment from, from this viewer, Jacob wrestling with God, mm. the jihad, if you will, that is that internal struggle. Because I am a believer that that God works, full disclosure here to, to you and the audience, God works also through other means um, as Elijah said on the mountain, you know, there are 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal that you don't even know about Elijah, right? Correct. Um, so whatever we think is the group of Christians that God is working with, there are other people that he's working with around the world and has sent messengers to them. He's not limited to um, only one mouthpiece. Absolutely. Um, but, but this wrestling with God, and we wrestled with Scripture, we really, really wanted to understand the truth of the Scripture. But the, but the hardest thing for God to reveal is the truth about ourselves. And that's mm -hmm. that moment that you experienced at age 12, right? Where the, the objectivity is lost and we, we become hypocritical and we cannot see our own hypocrisy. We cannot see the double standards that we operate by on a daily basis or the false equivalencies that we draw to different sides of hypocrisy. When you think of back in the Old Testament, the, the abomination of having two different two, two different sets of weights, right? Yeah. In how to measure and evaluate even ourselves. Um, 
where we fail to meet that law that you talked about that, you know, loving God with our whole hearts, but loving our neighbors as ourselves. So that insight, that objectivity into who and what we are and where we go to get the change that we need to be able to identify those, those things that need to be changed in us. Um, you, you've said so much of it so well tonight. I really do hope we can have you back on the show um, in the near future and, and unpack some more of this. Um, there's one There's one more thing I wanted to um, highlight, especially in, in terms of announcing next week's show to our audience. You mentioned at some point, um, I think, ob objective morality, where the atheists were looking for it. Um, for the audience and for you, if you'd like to tune in, next week's show is going to be on artificial morality. And it's actually the sponsor mm. of um, Ocean 2.0, who is looking into the uh, the ability to infuse artificial intelligence with the divine teachings. And can we can we teach artificial intelligence to behave in a more moral way? Um, That's interesting. Somewhat, somewhat scientific, somewhat, you know, science fiction, dystopian, maybe. Where does that end up? Are we um, are we then, you know, like Lucifer trying to be like the most high or is there mm -hmm. is there a good side to this? I think it'll be a really fascinating topic for everyone. Yeah, that um, is very interesting. And uh, John, we will definitely have you back to unpack some more of these. But, um, you know, as we as we wrap this up, we're just over time by a couple of minutes. Um, what words of wisdom do you have to leave our audience with? And um, <laughs> what, what would you like to explore uh, when we have you back again in the near future? Oh, boy. Um, you know, I guess words of wisdom, like I said, uh, I've been with my youngest son. Um, he's reading through the story. And he, again, has grown up in my household. We don't force Christianity on our children. And he's coming around with some interest to it. Um, he hasn't had it. He's now 21 years old. And I said, uh, I want you to start reading the story, which is kind of the the novel-like version of the Bible. So you don't have to go through the whole, whole Bible and get tripped up in Leviticus. And I said, when you're reading it, I want you to be interested in your heart. Do the horrific things that are punished and the ones that do the horrific things and find salvation. Always think about God is interested in their heart and look at, examine where their hearts are. And so I would say that to, as my words of wisdom to everyone is similar to, again, back to my 12 year old self, look at your heart, see where you are. If you don't know God, if you have no relationship, just look at where it is in your heart and start, start there. And um, I think God will open himself to you if you're willing to examine your own heart in this. Um, what would I like to talk about in the future? I would say I'm an open, I, I would talk about anything. I could do this stuff for hours, um, you know. Uh, well, we'll definitely have you back. We're excited yeah. <laughs> to uh, be, a, be a part of your journey as you relaunch your own podcast here in, in March. Yeah. And um, we're so, so glad to have you. This has been a wonderful show. Um, we did have another ad, but I felt that um, we'll, we'll just show that next week. And uh, to all our listeners, like, subscribe, share this with your friends, and tune in again next week for another hour of Created in the Image of God, the Role of Religion in 